My name is Kale Carter, and welcome to another show where we're going to introduce the history of black military service in World War II. Now, in order to properly introduce black military service, or really any historical subject in that, for that matter, you must provide some historical context to it, like what led up to it and how the lead up impacted the subject matter. Given that I'm going to be talking about African Americans or Black Americans in World War II, it is only proper that I start off with the historical context that led to Black involvement in World War II. So what better place to start covering Black involvement in World War II than explaining the history that led up to it by starting off in the Civil War. Black soldiers, Black men, Black women have fought in every war that this country has had. If you can name a war, then you best believe that there has been a black man or woman that has fought in that war. Now, with that being stated, the reason why I'm starting with the Civil War has three core reasons. One, the Civil War was the first large-scale employment of black soldiers in United States history. Now, as I mentioned before, you did have blacks that fought in the American Revolutionary War, the War of 1812. But in terms of numbers, it really wasn't a large-scale deployment of black soldiers. In fact, if you look back during that time period, you may find, at most, you may find a size of about roughly a regiment or, or individual company within a regiment. And in terms of black participation in general, it, the numbers wouldn't be that high. Now, with the Civil War... At the end of the Civil War, roughly over 200,000 or approximately 200,000 black Americans have served in the war. So the Civil War becomes the first large scale employment of black soldiers. Now, the second, the second reason why I want to start the Civil War too is because the Civil War, with the Civil War, you start seeing the early trends that get, that, that, are established regarding the employment of black soldiers in the US military. Now, prior to the Civil War, you did have cases here and there where if you managed to form um, of, I would say either a, a company size or, or company or in, in some cases regimental size of black soldiers, in most cases, they would be segregated. However, there are also other cases where you had black soldiers who were integrated into other units. So while you do like a like case in point, I think the one of the like, I like to make reference to popular culture because that's one of the best ways to kind of keep track of history. The movie The Patriot. Now, The Patriot that's not historically accurate, and laughably so, but I'm not gonna divulge into that, but in the case of the employment of black soldiers, in some cases, you did have black soldiers who were interspliced with regular Continental Army units or militias. Now, in the case, I think it was one unit, I think it was called the 1st Rhode Island Volunteer Infantry. Now, they actually had, I want to say basically with, within the 1st Volunteer Infantry Regiment out of Rhode Island, they actually had a, a black detachment within it. But I'm digressing. When you get to the Civil War, because of the nuances of the Civil War and the causes of it, you see questions arising about, okay, well, we want the, these people wish to fight in the war, but at the same time, we may have issues intermingling, intermingling them with regular units. Now... What ultimately became of that was the formation of the United States Color Troop, Color Troop Bureau, which oversaw the training and the training and the raising of black regiments in the Civil War. And ultimately, they followed a guideline of creating regiments that had that had predominantly white officers, black non-commissioned officers, and black enlisted. Now, of course, by the end of the Civil War, you did have cases where there were black commissioned officers, both as chaplains and even as people that, even as officers that oversaw the oversaw frontline service. 
But when they initially raised the units, they initially saw it with white officers and black enlisted. Now, of course, this sets the stage for the way that black soldiers will be employed in future wars, including World War II. Now, one of the last and crucial elements of the importance of discussing the Civil War in context to black participation in World War II is the, solidif the solidifying of the notion that military service is equal to citizenship or the fruits of citizenship. Now, really, in this case, this actually can be traced back to the American Revolutionary War, where you had individual cases of black soldiers who served in the Continental Army and as a reward for their service. In some cases, that they were enslaved, they might have gained freedom, and in some cases, they actually might have gained land or property. But in the case of the Civil War, it went to a whole new level. And by a whole new level, literally to get black soldiers involved in the Civil War, you had people who advocated on the behalf of use of black troops, such as Frederick Douglass and others that were in elected, elected positions, correlating military service and the military service in the Civil War with gaining the rights of citizenship. And in fact, there's a famous quote that was written by Frederick Douglass, which I'll take, I'll take time to read right now, the quote says, once let the black man get upon his person, the brass letters U.S., let him get an eagle on his button, a musket on his shoulder, and bullets in his pocket, and there is no power on earth or under the earth that can deny that he's earned the right to citizenship in the U.S. And he stated this in 1863. Now, the idea behind that is that with military service, because you help, not only not only have you helped fight for the ideals of the nation, but in the case of the Civil War, you actually helped to preserve the nation, then that automatically grants you and really entitles you to the fruits of citizenship in this country. So just to recap the three reasons why the Civil War was important in context to black military service in World War II, one, the first large-scale employment of black troops, which in turn, after the Civil War, the major wars after, such as World War I and ultimately World War II, which we will cover later, you start seeing a, a gradual increase of black military service from that point with the Civil War up to that point being the largest employment of black soldiers. The second reason being the methods of employing black soldiers. Now, I didn't really cover... I didn't really go into that much detail about the various units that were created during the Civil War for black soldiers, but during the Civil War, you saw the creative United States Color Troop units, which included black infantry regiments, black cavalry regiments, and even black field artillery, both light and heavy. So, but the more important takeaway is that during the Civil War, it sets up the the standard of how black soldiers will be handled in the U.S. military from this point forward up until really the 1950s, which is the ideology that you have black enlisted, you have a white officer to oversee them. You may have a case here and there of a black officer, but usually black officers don't really rise to a point of actually commanding a full-on a full on unit until really, I would say, later on, which I hopefully will cover before the end of the video. And the last major point being that the Civil War saw the establishing of, well, so more so the connection between black military service and the fruits of citizenship, which really is something that continues to this day. So with the Civil War, there's kind of, a, there's some debate on which was the first unit to be formed, first black unit to be formed in the Civil War. Now, people will, will say, well, oh, well, people will assume, and again, this is where pop, popular popular culture kind of plays a role in formulating what we think of certain time periods and what we think of, particularly in black military history. When you ask people on the street, well, what was the first black unit raised in the Civil War? 
automatically people will say, well, it was the Massachusetts 54th Infantry, Volunteer Infantry Regiment. And people will say, well, why? Why do you think that? And they will say, well, it's because of the movie Glory that came out. Now, Glory was an excellent movie, but as a South Carolinian, I take slight offense to that. And I take slight offense, not because the movie was a great movie, but because people will overlook the fact, well, people that are not into history, which ultimately you can't really blame people, which, like, it's kind of a pet peeve, but I really can't get mad because at the end of the day, like, most people are not into history, which hopefully, I hope if I do these videos that people will become more interested in history, but I'm digressing a little bit. So, there's actually kind of a debate and there's actually... There's actually kind of a debate when, regarding the first black unit to be raised in the Civil War. Now, of course, from, coming from South Carolina, I'm going to say the first South Carolina volunteers out of the Sea Islands. Now, officially, that unit was raised while the mobilization started in the late, eight, like late 1862. The unit officially was brought into service in 1863. But as a historian, I will be remiss to say that while, I, while the South Carolinian in me wants to say the first South Carolina volunteers, the historian in me is actually has to constantly remind myself that actually I'm actually wrong about that. Because according to records from rec recent records, actually one of the first black units to be raised in the Civil War doesn't come from South Carolina. It doesn't come from Massachusetts. It actually comes from Louisiana. And the reason why is because during the Civil War, because of the the racial structure of Louisiana, which had basically, you had whites, Creoles, and free people of color, and then enslaved, because of that free people of color, which were basically mulattoes and people, black folks who were mixed and, and people like that, they were actually able to raise a volunteer regiment. And then, of course, when... The Union forces came to Louisiana in the early 1860s, well, 1861, well, 1862, 1863. They were actually able to take from that unit and actually build upon it by basically bringing in not only free people of color, but also contraband, which becomes a term referred to formerly enslaved. So, to recap that, first black unit is kind of a toss up. Some folks will say first South Carolina volunteers and I'm kind of in that camp too. But really when you look at the documentation in terms of units that's raised, the first one's actually a black unit out of Louisiana. Sadly, the name escapes right, right now. And I know if people see this video, they're going to probably chide me and say, well, it was this name and this unit. I know. But it's good to always have, it's always good to have experts on, have experts basically watching this so they can tell you when you mess up. So, but... So the Civil War lasts from 1861 to 1865, and during the Civil War, black soldiers proved their worth in combat. Now, of course, you have you have black soldiers, of course, in, in terms of the early battles, we think about Fort Wagner, but also you have the battles around the siege of, siege, siege of uh, Petersburg, where you see a lot of black soldiers, and you also see black soldiers, you probably see black soldiers in all theaters of the Civil War. So when the Civil War comes to a close in 1865 and the US the US starts looking to expand westward, the US the US Congress, in a bid to encourage westward expansion, decides to expand the army. And building upon the previous experience in the Civil War, noting how noting the performance of uh, the black volunteer regiments as well as the United States Colored Troop regiments. They decided, the Congress decided to, to, to create a total of six all-black regiments to be included in the regular army, which this right here was also historical because this was the first time that black soldiers could be employed in the regular army, thus making a career out of military service, something that, that we still do to this day. So... What were the units, you may ask? The units were the 9th and 10th Cavalry, which will be covered, of course, in World War II, and later the 38th, the 39th, 40th, and 41st Infantry Regiments. Now, one of the things I did read over when I was 
when I actually studied this back when I was a little bit younger, Congress initially thought about providing a light artillery, a light artillery regiment, and they thought about basically including that in the bill, but that part died in Congress, so we ultimately end up getting the six, those six regiments. Now, by 1869, the army was restructured yet again, so, and what ended up happening is that the army reduced its size, reduced its infantry regiments, and thus the 38th, 39th, 40th, and 41st infantry regiments were condensed down into the 24th and 25th infantry regiments. So after 1869, in the regular army, you had four black black regiments, which was the 9th and 10th cavalry and the 24th and 25th infantry regiments. Now, while I'm focusing on the numbers of these regiments, those that may be watching this will better know them as the Buffalo Soldiers. Now, when it comes to the Buffalo Soldiers, they may people may ask, well, well, one, how do they get the name Buffalo Soldiers? How does that translate into, well, how does the how do they get the name Buffalo Soldiers, and how does that really translate all this into World War II? Well, initially, the name Buffalo Soldier. It doesn't really have an exact source. It's highly speculated that it came from the Native Americans that witnessed Black Calvary on the Western frontier and looking at attributes that they would notice in nature, taking notes of, oh, well, these, these new soldiers on the frontier, they have dark skin, dark eyes, they have naturally curly hair, but they also have a tenacious fighting spirit, things that they would notice in the buffalo. Now, of course, in terms of records, the earliest known record of the term being used was actually, I want to say it was about 1871, 1872, a little fuzzy on the date, the exact date per se, but it comes up in a letter where, a, where an army wife was writing back to one of her, one of her, she was corresponding with someone and she makes mention of, of members of the black regiments writing out and how the Native Americans referred to them as Buffalo men. Now, when it comes to the Buffalo soldiers and their service on the Western frontier, up to this point, most of the, when we talk about the Western frontier, of course, you get into controversial territory because of course it was Westward expansion and it also involves the killing of Native Americans and forcing them off their land. Now, I'm wanting to say that the, that the Buffalo Soldiers did play a part in that. However, thus far from research, when it involves in massacres of Native Americans and other situations like that, thus far, I have yet to find any records of Buffalo Soldiers participating in any of those. And in fact, from doing initial research, you actually had the Buffalo Soldiers themselves being conflicted about what was happening on the frontier. You had some soldiers, some Buffalo soldiers who viewed it in a light of, well, it's better them than me. And you had others that saw it, well, they actually empathize with the Native Americans and X, Y, and Z. Now, I'll bring all that to say that when it comes to a historical context and regarding these subjects, these subjects are very these are subjects that are not that easy to talk about and they require a lot of nuance to understand and not only nuance to understand, but to be able to discuss them in a light that does justice to everyone involved. And by doing just, I mean providing historical fact and being forthright about the facts rather than X, Y, and Z. So, but... When it comes to the Buffalo Soldiers' role on the Western frontier, you see a lot of infrastructure building, in essence, taming the West, providing string up telegraph wire, helping oversee the protection of railroads and providing protection for settlements. So, but of course with this, by the time you start getting towards the close of the 1800s and to the turn to the start of the early 1900s, you start seeing Buffalo soldiers getting employed in roles that that we would normally not think of as being military. Roles such as 
overseeing the protection of national parks, being the first park rangers. In the case of, well, actually, I'll actually probably cover that in the in the second video, covering the history from the night from World War One to, of course, the even World War Two. But you even see Buffalo soldiers fighting forest fires and stuff. So you see all these interesting roles getting cropped up. So by the time 1898 rolls around, of course, we get involved in the Spanish-American War. And of course, the, how, they get, how they got started, it got started through the explosion of the Maine, but really when you look at it as cases of yellow germ, journalism and other stuff. So, but I digress. So with the Spanish-American War, the black soldiers who were previously based on the frontier of Buffalo soldiers were brought back to the East Coast to be deployed to Cuba. Now, in addition to the Buffalo soldiers, you also had the creation of black volunteer infantry regiments or black volunteer regiments. And in fact, one of the people who helped spearhead and actually support this was Booker T. Washington. And of course, if you are a student of Booker T. Washington, you know of the speech involving where he says that they say cast down your buckets and I can't go into all the details about that. But, but the idea behind the creation of these black volunteer regiments was both to show that, hey, that when that basically that blacks, that we as blacks are just as American as anyone else. But the more nefarious side of things too was that the ideas that people had when they created these units is that, hey, these people, because they're, because they're black and they're, they appear to have more tropical physicality, they will be immune to the tropical diseases that would impact uh, white soldiers, hence the term immune regiments. Now, of course, that ideology proved to be very false, and it proved, ultimately proved to be very false. I'll leave it at that. But in addition to fighting in Cuba, you start seeing the deployment of Buffalo soldiers to areas that were formerly under Spanish control, which primarily, in addition to Cuba, also included the Philippines. And this led to the Philippine-American War or the Philippine Insurrection. Now, with black soldiers being deployed to the Philippines during this time period, you start seeing you start seeing elements that kind of that kind of made early appearances on the Western frontier, but unlike the Western frontier, you start seeing black leadership starting to speak out about this. And this is more so discussion of, shall we say, American imperialism, if you de depending on how you refer to it. And with black leadership at the time, black leadership was pretty vocal about sending black soldiers who keep in mind this was still the late 1890s 1900s this was still this was basically the the fruit this this is the beginnings of the jim crow south really well by this point jim the jim crow jim crow laws were in full swing so black leaders and black intellectuals felt a certain way about black soldiers who did not have any fr major freedoms at home going abroad and fighting against fighting to oppress another group of people who were previously subjugated by another group only to be subjugated, resubjugated by another group. So, and of course, this this feeling not only was at the intellectual level with black so with black the black community, but also was seen on the lower levels with black soldiers, black soldiers on the ground. And one of the more famous or well, famous or depending on how you view it, infamous examples of this was a soldier named Fagan. Fagan was a soldier in the 24th Infantry Regiment who, who for some reason or another, defected from the U.S. Army and sided with the Filipinos and actually fought beside the Filipinos against U.S. forces. So, in closing, when it comes to this first segment of leading to World War II, we see how the 1800s really have the 1800s have really really the 1800s and more specifically the civil war laid the groundwork as to how black soldiers how black soldiers as well as the black community 
Well, black soldiers, the black community, as well as the U.S. government would look at in the employment of using black soldiers. Of course, in the terms of the black community and black soldiers, this is a way to gain freedom, citizenship, and prove that in spite of the way we've been done in this country, that we too are Americans and thus we are deserving of the benefits of American citizenship. And on the other hand, you see policies that that fit the policies of employing, employing of black soldiers fitting very well into the Jim Crow, the Jim Crow narrative and really the social Darwin narrow social so, social Darwinist narrative that while black soldiers are capable they need to be monitored and in fact in the next video I will actually go into detail from a U.S. Army War College study that was done in immediately after World War One that covers more detail of this. Now another thing we also covered in this video too is that in the aftermath of the Civil War military service becomes prized not just because it serves as a way serves as a way for to gain citizenship but it also serves as a way to have a a career and not only just any not just any career a stable a stable career where you can learn a trade trade gain an education and this was accomplished through per the the service in the buffalo soldier regiments out in the western frontier we also covered the fact that while black soldiers were happy to serve on behalf of this country they also saw firsthand the the complexities of serving for this country meaning that while on the one hand you like the soldiers will see themselves as americans and wanting to gain the, the full benefits of citizenship they also would witness and in some cases have differing views about their role in in you say we say imperialism or their role in expansionism that would result in that would result in the subjugation of other groups and in some cases the extermination of other groups so this really concludes the first introduction video i hope i really hope that I was able to try to provide at least some insight into the uniqueness or well, the things that kind of that kind of build upon built up to black military service in World War II. The next video the next video is gonna also be another introductory video, and this video is gonna cover pretty much the period where I stopped at, which the Philippine American War lasted from the 1890s to the early 1900s. So the next video will really cover World War I and the interwar period and thus the eve of World War II. So like I said, I hope y'all enjoyed this video. I hope I was able to provide some insights and even I actually hope that I was actually able to generate some questions because the easiest way that I've learned in the past that people learn is through asking questions so i hope this video was informative i hope that this video generates some questions and i want to take time for to thank y'all for actually viewing this like i love and i love military history i love black military history but at the end of the day what i really enjoy is when people are well i'm actually able to take this skill and actually teach some people about this unsung history so that is it, y'all. Uh, thank y'all. I hope y'all have a good evening, and I will see y'all next time.